What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Mike Dolce Show. I hope you're doing well. Well, here we go. We kick off the interview series that you guys have heard about. And today we're going to interview my good friend, Mary Shenouda. Now, Mary Shenouda is a highly sought after performance chef and specialist. Her clients include both professional athletes and Hollywood entertainers. And Mary is also the creator and founder of Fat Fudge, a high performance food line of her own formulation. I really, we are just scratching the surface of who Mary is, what she does, but really we're going to dig down deep into her knowledge base of nutrition and find ways that it can certainly help you in your own time. Of course, badged up members of our community, please feel free to leave your questions in the chat. Mary and I, every so often, will jump over into the chat, answer some of those questions as we continue on. So without further ado, Mary Shenouda. Hey, Mary, how are you? I'm pretty solid today. How are you doing over there? I'm wonderful, thank you. So you're California right now, huh? California, split time between San Francisco and Los Angeles. Oh, wow. How's, but I mean, you know, not, the, the conversation isn't going to be about that, but how is it living <laughs> and navigating California during a pandemic? I, if I'm being like really honest, it's, it's not that bad. I really? don't know how, I don't honestly, some people have said this is the worst thing they've ever experienced. And I, I dare to ask sometimes if this is the worst thing you've experienced, the inconveniences of a pandemic, has your life really been that bad? Yeah. I've had some serious traumas in my life. Um, navigating day to day isn't that difficult. I don't commute. I don't have to go into an office. I'm self-employed. I yeah. do work with sports organizations, so I do have to get tested more often than your average person. Yeah. But as far as like going into stores, going into restaurants, I approach it with kindness and patience and I receive kindness and patience in return. Yeah. And so a lot of my friends have left California and moved away, but they still talk shit about California. And I'm more like, stop talking about your ex. Sounds like you're not over her. There you go. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm still here helping the community and running my business. <laughs> right on. Now you're in California, but I want to go back a little bit and, and give a little yeah. bit of background. So tell us a little bit about where you grew up. I want to learn because I, I know you're, you're not from California originally and you come from a, a diverse cultural background of Egyptian cultural heritage. background. Yeah. yeah. So my parents are Egyptian. They immigrated here a year before I was born. I was born in New Hampshire. Right. If I have a couple of scotches in me, it's New Hampshire. New Hampshire. Uh, there we go. But, but I grew up in the Bay Area. My, my uh, parents are both academic. My dad's an engineer. My mom's a biochemist. So I grew up in San Jose um, for my childhood, lived in San Francisco for my 20s and then uh, moved to Los Angeles and I've been here about 10 years, but I'm well traveled. I've spent significant time in Texas, um, Egypt, of course, different parts of Europe. But at, at the heart of it, I would say I'm I'm I like to say I'm California. I was raised here, but our average California finds me to be intense. Yeah. <laughs> but that might be the Middle Eastern entrepreneurial athlete yeah. uh, combination. But yeah, that California is home for me. Gotcha. And so your parents, what did they do growing up? Well, give me a little bit more about your home life. Uh, well, my dad was an engineer and my mom was a biochemist and they both were career people and I have two younger siblings. Um, and so growing up at home, they're very religious at home. It was either church related things or academic related things like they aren't in sports. That's something that I naturally gravitated towards. Um, and then in my neighborhood, there was only one other girl that lived on the street and she was three years younger than me. And when you're that age, three years is significant. There's not a lot in common when you're yeah. 10 and they're three years younger than that. So everyone else that was my age were boys. So outside the home was sports or causing a ruckus. And then in home, it was religion or academics. And religion, which religion was it? Was it Islam, Christianity, Judaism? Coptic Orthodox, which is uh, one of the oldest forms of Christianity. Okay. And so religious sounds like very religious. What was that? Now, I grew up in a semi-religious, traditional Roman Catholic, but I went, you know, household, I went to Catholic school. So all 13 years I was in a, a Catholic school, right? Yeah. So, but it sounds like you actually, I wouldn't consider my upbringing religious. We went to church on Sunday. And that was kind of it. Don't use the Lord's name in vain type of stuff. Sure. But you, sure. it sounds like it was a little bit more stringent. So uh, just snapshot. What is that? Yeah. My dad was ordained by Pope Shenouda. 
Uh, he was a deacon. My mom is also involved in the church. Um, it was church Sundays, Saturdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Christmas, Easter, Halloween. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, but I, I grew up in a religious structure that was, uh, yeah, very strict and very traditional because it's very old, but also one that encouraged a lot of curiosity and questioning. You were allowed to ask questions. You were allowed yeah. to be curious, which was really great. Fasting is a big component of, of that faith. So it's interesting that fasting is cool now. <laughs> no, and everything, and it'll be uncool again in three years. So. I'm into this new fasting thing. Have you heard of it, Mary? I'm like, oh, you mean fasting that multiple cultures have been doing for thousands of years? Yeah. I've heard of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but it was, it, um, I think you could, you could compare orthodoxy a little bit to Catholicism. Oh, I think that some of the differences I picked up on is Catholicism really focuses on guilt and the crucifixion, whereas uh, orthodoxy focuses on the resurrection um, and like, just like be a good human, okay. do good things. Being Egyptian, I really resonated with the, uh, the, the deity of ancient Egypt, Ma'at, or I think it's like 42 laws of Ma'at. I have a tattooed on my body. Um, and if you look at the rules of Ma'at, most of them actually mirror Stoicism. So these yeah. men later on who are now credited for Stoicism, if you look to the Book of the Dead, there's a lot of things in there about what's considered sins is like letting your emotions dictate your behavior, um, doing wrong to others. And so I really, really resonate with some of the, the spirituality of what I grew up as an Orthodox and then um, the, the stoicism around Ma'at. She was created by the gods to maintain order and peace. And so when you die, she would weigh your heart against a feather to make sure you lived a just and pure life. And that would grant you access to the afterlife. And I, I merged those two and then just experiences in life and being an athlete in California kind of is the the melt, the beginning melting pot. Um, I jokingly say I'm too Egyptian to be American and too American to be Egyptian. And I think a lot of kids who are first generation um, from immigrant families probably feel the same. Like they don't, they don't really know where they belong, but they do have the ability to fit into a lot of places and resonate with a lot of different people. Yeah, and I think that is the essence of being American is we're all immigrants and children of immigrants, right? It's founded by immigrants, you know, quite literally. I have a Native American background, so my own family would push back on that a little bit, right? Because, you know, they were here, you know, born here, lived here, and generations here. But also my father's side is Sicilian. So he came over. He was first generation. His siblings were born over in Sicily. Parents came over on the boat, naturalized through Ellis Island. So yeah. he was the first generation. Hustler, right? So there's that. He had that bred into him seeing that. You know, and I, I think that certainly was passed down into me. And like you, I think you see a lot of that with immigrants in that there's this this hustle. We come over, you know, we or families come over with the dream of making something, leaving a place, you're going to a new place. You don't leave a place because it's awesome. You leave because you're trying to do something better, whatever that might be. Right. So, right, right, so right. coming here. Now your right. parents are both I'm um, go ahead. You, uh, your parents are both engineers. Right. Scientist. Biochemist. Right? Biochemist. Right. My, my mom is a biochemist. My dad's an engineer. And did they work in the academic setting? Did they work private sector? Like where, where were their skills? Uh, at home? Both. 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 Yeah. Gotcha. And so a house of science also blended with religion can be odd, a little bit different. And for you, was there any sort of like, did you have any rebellion? And I, all kids rebel, right? But did you have any rebellion against the religion per se or rebellion against the academic side of biochemist and an engineer? That can be rough. No, I was always super curious. Again, I, I'm not, I don't, I mean, I don't really, I don't usually discuss my parents too much because they didn't ask to be like, my, I don't post about them on social. They didn't ask for this huge audience. Yeah. But the most, the most that I, I will say to respect them is, um, the whole, you know, when parents are like, if as long as you live under my roof, it's my rules. Yeah. I really respected that. Yeah. And so I never really rebelled as long as I lived under the roof. I just moved out when I was 17. <laughs> so I could then Which is have my, of rebellion. So, so I could have my own roof. <laughs> but I so I dropped out of high school as a junior. Okay. Good grades, varsity tennis player. 
I was very bored and unhappy. And I went to my counselor to look at my credits for my senior year and understand it. And they're like, you have four credits left to go right for junior year. But what do I have, what do I have left for senior year? She's like, no, you've exceeded. And I'm like, you want me to stay here for another year and a half for four credits? I'm not about that life. So I dropped out and I'm very, again, interesting opposite immigration story. I'm the first person in the entire family extended to not go to college. Yeah. <laughs> so I took a different route. So I dropped out of high school, uh, got into tech really early. And so when I moved out, I was supporting myself. Um, my parents didn't love that, as you can imagine, but yeah. they also didn't stop me and they supported whatever version of myself I wanted to be. Uh, my my parents, while they may not have agreed with a lot of my decisions, they never asked me to be anything other than myself. And that is a huge, 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 huge gift. Not to say we didn't fight or disagree um, or I didn't understand or they didn't understand. But the thing that I think we both understood is that we were different. And how are we going to to still care about each other and love each other and support each other through those differences? So, so you, you drop out of high school at 17, you leave your house at 17. How do you survive? How did you pay your bills? Like, what was that transition like? Because 17, you and I now, we can look back, I'm, I'm you know, older than, than yourself, but we're, we're both adults. I can look at 17 year olds and with respect, the 17 year old is a child in many ways in the world, especially I think 17 year old today is not what they were a decade or more ago. So you at 17 entering into the world it's a tough place out there. How did you get by? Like, what did I you worked do? in tech. I worked in tech. Okay. I was working in tech sales. I was making pretty decent money at a really young age. Um, and sales, if you produce your number, you make good money. I was like fully supporting myself okay. um, and wasn't receiving help from my family. Um, I wasn't honest about my age on the applications but they didn't ask. And then by the time they find out that you're a kid, you're at 156% of your quota. <laughs> They're not going to get rid of a top producer. No. Um, and I, I mean, I had a lot of uh, emotional maturity. So my, my friends were my colleagues. My colleagues were 10 and 15 years my senior. I had the friends I went to school with. So I had two friends groups. I had the friends that were my age that were messing around, um, going to college. And then I had the friends that I worked with. And so I got to balance being my age, but also creating a, a foundation of a career. And I stayed in tech for about 10 years, ended up moving to San Francisco, which really allowed me to understand uh, business, communication, teams, um, building out structures. So when I left to start my own business, my college was my experience in, in a corporate setting. Yeah. And when was that? Did you, you leave? So or late twenties or so you left and you started as your own, you know, owner, as an entrepreneur, building out your fitness business. Your, I'm sorry. The consultancy, the per performance chef. Okay. Which is yeah, what yeah. you're doing now, you know, a, a couple other things that you're doing also. So we'll get in that in a little bit deeper into yeah. the show, but I, yeah. I really love to hear the background because it is very formative. Our background in many ways, it shapes who we are. And I like to hear the, the motivation, also some of the struggles. Everybody, we all encounter struggles along the way and challenges, and we're, we're forced with these almost ultimatums, very self-imposed in many ways, and we, we pick left or right, you know, the fork in the road, and it's formative for yeah. us. So it's interesting, I think, to kind of understand a little bit more about you and your background. Now, also, you know, I, I know that you had some struggles, health struggles as a child coming up. And that's really what I want to start digging into right now. I believe very formative to look at the woman you are now and the, the, you know, the business that you run. But as we go back into your grade school years, I mean, you told a, a you know, very um, telling story about, you know, being in the nurse's office, you know, wrenched over complaining about well, you, you, the pain that you were in and kind of being sloughed off as it's all in your head, but you were right. suffering. So break that down for us, if you would. You mean to start with the the autoimmune stuff? Well, yeah. I mean, just so you as a child and, you know, because this some of this is on your website and, you know, yep. social media. And, you know, I've, we've been friends, you know, social friend for quite a while and, and just yeah. in each other's spheres and, and such. But I, I want to start drilling down deeper into gut health and which is a yeah. specialty of yours. We're going to get into the gut reset. But I want to really start in the beginning because most people right now walking around 30, 40, 50 years old, they don't even think about their gut. 
No, they, they, have, others, they have other symptoms. Yeah, they have other symptoms that they're masking with medications. But um, so for me, I started getting migraines in first and second grade, and the migraines would lead to awful bouts of vomiting. And when you're a kid, for whatever reason, I don't know if it's changed, if you go to the nurse's office and you don't have a fever, they typically send you back to class. And when you yeah. have a migraine, you don't have a fever. And and I was a really good kid. Like I was quiet. I would always ask for permission, permission for things. So this idea that the nurse thought that I was lying about something out of class was was really heartbreaking for yeah. me. I'm, I'm such a good kid. Never got my name on the board. I got my name on the board once because I put my head down on my desk because I had a migraine. And the teacher thought that I was being defiant. And I was as as upset, if not more, about my name being on the board for the first time than I was the physical pain I was in. But there was one instance where I went to the nurse office, uh, nurse's office and I was trying to explain to her that I'm in a lot of pain and to call my mom. And my mom is aware of my migraines. I just needed her to call my mom. And she's like, I just don't think you're sick. And the response to that wasn't voluntary. I, I ended up getting into a vomiting bout and there was like vomit everywhere. And she's like, oh, maybe she is sick. But that that was like the first feeling of betrayal from an adult. And then you, you move through your life with doctors who you trust, you trust doctors because yeah. they're smarter than you in in theory. And, and you, they tell you it's psychosomatic and you you start to question yourself and you're all these different medications. And so for me, because they were so often, I had a headache every day, migraines two or three times a week, hospitalization once a month, because sometimes I would vomit so much. I would then pass out. Um, and sometimes I'd be alone. And so somebody would just find me with vomit passed out and they want to assume you're overdosed on drugs and you have to try to explain this severe migraines. But I got frustrated with it affecting my livelihood. So I just had a little like chit chat with myself or like, this is your baseline. This is your normal. This is what you're going to have to deal with. Now, how are you going to work around it to still play sports, to still show up to your friend's birthday parties, to still be able to go to work? So I found ways to work around it, whether it's sunglasses at my desk, taking naps underneath my desk when the pain's too intense. When I played basketball, my coach knew about my migraines and it affects my eyesight. So I'd be sitting sideline with a head wrap, kind of holding the pressure in. And then, mm -hmm. then I would tap her and let her know I've got some plays in me and she'd throw me in the game. I'd look at her when I start to go dark again, she'd sub me out again. Um, Wow. And I, I would just stay at the birthday party as long as possible until this, the, the room starts to get all like woozy and then I'd go home. And when you're in corporate and you're the youngest and usually the only female on the sales team, you can't have a bad day. They want to find any reason to give you a hard time because you're a girl and you're younger. And if you don't feel good, it's like, oh, did a boy break up with you? It's always the default people go to when you don't feel good. Very yeah. frustrating. And then it was one of my last um, visits to the ER where I was just getting so frustrated because they give you morphine and fenugreek, I think I'm saying it correctly. And the, the morphine creates a very anxious response in my body and I don't like it and it doesn't even help the pain. It just knocks me out for my body to sleep through the migraine. And so one of the last visits, I'm like, I am so tired of this medication. Someone needs to tell me what's causing the migraines. And it was, it was a very, it was a very dramatic scene. I'm yelling. I'm frustrated. I'm ripping the IV out of my arm. I'm storming out of the hospital. And then that's when I was like, wait, I am so type A in every part of my life, yet I'm relying on these people to tell me the source of it. And a light bulb went off. I studied the mitochondria when I was in high school. I found this TED Talk by Dr. Terry Walls. I started diving into the mechanism of my and into the mitochondria going into the gut. And then I sent out my own lab work, which showed me that I was celiac along and tolerance to casein and soy. And I was pumped. I'm like, cool. Now we have an answer. Now we can begin to heal ourselves. Well, you say celiac, if you can, can you define what celiac is for those who will be watching this? So we all are speaking the same language. It's an autoimmune disorder. It's genetic. Um, and you, you just are unable to process the protein gluten. Um, and you can have one or two of those genes. I have both those genes. And so gluten is basically death for me. And so not death, like 
anaphylactic shock, but it's this slow process that can cause a myriad of other problems if not addressed. And so it creates these tiny little holes in your lower intestine. Leaky gut is the best way to explain that. And then that is causing massive inflammation and it could come up as migraines, joint pain. It can create, um, it can create things like tumors. It's, it's, I know that inflammation now is like the thing that we talk about and yeah. inflammation can seem ambiguous, but as we further understand all the things that can cause it, that was essentially the root of a lot of the issues that I was having was the fact that I was celiac and I shouldn't be consuming gluten. And that's not the same as gluten intolerance or someone who might be having a reaction to gluten as a result of damage being caused by some other food that they might have that similar reaction to. Yeah, well said. And it's often misunderstood by the general person because let's say Gwyneth Paltrow and whomever else, you know, whatever influencer might be out there, they're all following these gluten-free diets. So people think that they are allergic to gluten when in fact they, they might just simply have an intolerance to gluten containing foods, or also they might actually have a negative reaction to some of the chemicals that are also in foods that just happen to con contain gluten, which are possibly like more prevalent, right? Bread right. products are probably the, the, one of the biggest culprit as far as having uh, uh, an array of the synthetic toxic chemicals, as we like to call them. But people will point to, well, there's wheat in it. I must be glue. I must have a gluten allergy. No, you simply are consuming massive amounts of 17 other chemicals. Right. Or it could be it could be soy. It could be you could have an intolerance to ginger. You could have an intolerance to all these other things that create inflammation. So you're going to continue to have an inflammatory response to other ingredients because you haven't addressed the root cause. And I think you've seen me post about it. Like I'm known as paleo chef, but my philosophy is paleo. Well, what's going to work for you is not going to work for me. And what works today may not work in six months. Yeah. So no matter what somebody comes to me with an ideology, especially in the sports world, some athletes are like, what about going plant based? I'm like, look. I'm going to listen to your blood test. Nothing is going to trump what your blood chemistry tells us. And we're going to follow what your body is telling us, not what some influencer has said, not what the latest diet book says. It's always going to be customized and it's going to change throughout your life. Yeah. And you mentioned athletes. How many of your athletes excel on exclusively plant-based diets? Do any? <laughs> donuts boom <laughs> zero it's so frustrating and the ones who want to be primarily plant-based yeah. for religious reasons for personal reasons we find we do find a compromise of like look you can go full-on plant-based when when you retire right now you, your salary and the championships rely on your optimal perform performance and that's not going to happen so we find ways to supplement with liver capsules we find ways to supplement with bone broth we find ways we're like okay you know this week i need to have this one day of chicken or fish and of course the sourcing we're going to do our very best to get the best sourcing but as far as plant-based across the board zero 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 and what do you find <laughs> their motivation is is it philosophical is it ethical is it someone in their sphere of influence is pushing them did they see the new shiny object on Instagram, let's say, yeah. what is pushing them? Because typically they achieve levels of excellence, fame, and, and monetary reward not following plant-based, but they get to this level, and I deal with this also, where it's, it's more shiny object syndrome that I kind of define it as. What about you? What do you think? Like, What makes this odd shift? This worked so sure. well for me until this point, but now I want to change everything. Sure. Um I will say very, very, very small percentage. It is religious, ethical, and we do our best with that. Yep. Um, the other ones are they will see somebody in their life go plant-based and be suddenly healthy, but yep. they don't realize it's not that they went plant-based, it's that they stopped eating shit. Yeah. And that exactly. plant-based is going to catch up to them and have the opposite effect very soon. And then the, the rest of it is a combination, mostly of the shiny object, the latest documentary, the latest figurehead who like, there's a lot of people that have books. I don't generally get negative like this, but fuck Do it. Do it, girl, <laughs> there's, come on. Generally, there's a lot of folks who have these books and these diet books and these, these platforms who are talking about diet 
and consulting on it. And I always ask them, how many clients do you have? They don't, they don't have a practice. Yeah. They are going off latest studies. And I will tell you, practical application and field experience will always trump the study. I have 10 years of practical application across hundreds of athletes and thousands of clients. And so I am able to see what works and create those, see those anomalies and the things in common. So those, those folks that have these huge platforms and influence will co-sign on a documentary. The, co- the documentary is done brilliantly and it looks really compelling. If I didn't know any better, I'd probably be following that documentary, but I happen to know better. And so there is that, there is that. And I'm not going to push back and butt heads with my athletes. I'm like, let's just see. Yeah. Let's just see how you perform. But there is, it's diet is not that complicated. It really isn't. It's always back to the basics. What's always has worked will continue to work. There are some modifications that are need for particular people. And then for performance athletes, and I'm talking about, I've, I am lucky to work with some of the goats and some of the greatest teams. And so for them, yeah, we do, we do something that you could be considered a little extra with like ingredients, a little more obscure, but it's because that's what their livelihood depends on. Your average person may not need test every six to eight weeks because they're not trying to win a championship and that's totally fine. But diet isn't that complicated. I think I had posted some funny tweet where I'm like, only eat keto between these hours when you're not paleo. But before this time, I'm like, why are you guys so confused? It's so simple. (laughs) (laughs) How true, right? You know, and it's, it's unfortunate. I, I rally against the, I call exclusionary restrictive fad dietary practices, which result in disordered eating amongst the hardworking folk that just want to feel better, live better. Like that's all that matters. And then we get the keto, we get the carnivore, we get the vegan, we get the exclusionary mindset. And what does that do? It, it robs most people of the high net nutrient food sources they need to be consuming so they can just live better, feel and it better. Creates anxiety right? and, it, and it, it causes their body to not be as metabolically flexible because their body gets so adjusted to this one restrictive way of eating. Yeah. When they do have something outside of that, they think that reaction is a negative reaction when really it, your body's trying to adjust to what it hasn't been doing. And not to say that there isn't a, a like, uh, a place for keto when you're treating something very serious for a short period of time. There isn't, there is a place for carnivore for a short period of time when you're treating something very specific, because there are some um, like epilepsy seems to respond really well to keto, but your average person doesn't need to stick to that very, very strict the entire time. So there, yes, there are gotchas in which it makes sense. And there's a time and a place for it all. I do love exclusion diets as a baseline to then reintroduce foods. If you're someone who has persistent symptoms that you're not really aware of, but again, your average person just needs to eat better in general and better. Isn't that complicated. It doesn't always have to be organic. It's make, make your best choice. Like I, I was interviewed and someone was like, well, what do you do when you don't have things access to you when you're on a road trip? I'm like, look, if you're like me, you have to plan ahead. I have an autoimmune disorder. Yeah. I have to plan. Stay ready. But your average person, if you end up at a McDonald's, there is a way to make a better choice at McDonald's. It's not like, fuck it, I'm not going to eat. It's yeah. like there's a way to make better choices. So it's, it's really about just doing the best you can with what you have for your average person. Yeah. And what we try and educate is – you can go to a grocery store just as easily as you can go to a fast food restaurant. Like you can walk in, you can walk into a gas station and buy a banana and a bottle of water to get you that 30, 60, 90 minutes to the point that now you can sit down at a Denny's. I I work with the the U S military a lot on the domestic bases. If you've ever been to a domestic U S military base, they are surrounded by Denny's and strip clubs. Pretty much like the, the kind of the worst choices in the world for, for, you know, young, um, enlisted men and women <laughs> or the best the choices in the world. <laughs> yeah. I was like, spend your money, blow your money. Um, but anyway, um, I can still sit down and order. I, I can get a whole avocado. I, yeah. I can get poached eggs. Oh yeah. Can, that's my go-to, right? Eggs and avocado are my freaking go-to even on days where I have things available to me. But I start every day with an avocado because it sets me up. Even if 
fat fudge is also something that I created as yeah. dense nutrients for on the go. And it, it's interesting to military. We have a lot of military people that buy fat fudge because yeah. it's just, it's there. It's got essential micronutrients in there and it will hold them over until they get to a meal that will fit whatever it is they're trying to accomplish. And that's, that's the concept is you want to build a bridge using good decisions, being intentional, being mindful, being accountable, build that bridge to the next robust meal choice, right? That we can all find, especially you're living in the United States. Come on. There's not a lot of excuses to eat poorly, but most people they're looking for a reason to go to McDonald's or Chipotle or some of the other, um, you know, poor choices. We, I, I want to you know, briefly touch back on because we, we were you know, speaking of the, the fad diets, whether they be the keto, the carnivore, the vegan. Like I put carnivore and vegan in the same category. They're just extreme ends where they move away from the middle. And that's the most ideal as it, I call it the omnivorous. Not, not I call it, but it's an omnivorous meal plan. Right. Plant based and animal based, but devoid of the synthetic toxic chemicals. Right. So let's right. avoid the, the ultra processing. Let's avoid the highly, highly palatable foods. And let's just get back to eating a wide variety of healthy foods that you enjoy that digest well, that gives you energy. Right. So it's all kind of very common sense. And unfortunately, people don't need to hire you or I to help make those decisions out of the gate, right? As they become more specialized, if they have the budget, they want a little bit more structure. Right. They want us right, to right. maybe do some of the thinking for them, like your clients, some of my clients, that's fine. We can then take you to the next level. But I say you can get like 80 to 90% of the way to exactly the way you want to look and feel, just following the basic principles of healthy whole food nutrition. You'll know yeah, in 15 to 45 basic. minutes if something doesn't digest well. Your body's going to tell you that pretty quick, right? Yes, yes. And sometimes I will say like you'll you'll get a response within 45 minutes. But if it is something that's a little more uh, intense on your body, those symptoms may linger for a few days. Yeah. So be mindful of that. That way you're not attaching those, those long-term symptoms with some other foods you might be eating. But you can figure out how to eat by following all my free content that I post on Instagram every single day. My athletes, like I am doing super, I'm, I'm customizing their pre-workout based on their body chemistry. I'm customizing their halftime stuff based on their body chemistry. You don't need to hire me for that. <laughs> like that is just doesn't even make sense for your average person. <laughs> right. I'm over here like, you want to. I'm over here like chat because I really do. I'll check the weather and based on the weather for like a soccer player, I will then make changes to their pre-workout. Um, that's really dated. I don't, yeah, those are not my I mean, they're still my clients and friends, but my clients now you can check I, out my Instagram. <laughs> I mean, Superman, come on. Superman Brendan, Brendan's a dear friend. All right. Um, but but like I I like that website was built a long time ago. Um, I don't generally like start saying the names of my clients, but if you just scroll my Instagram, I'll repost stuff they post about me. It's very yeah. easy to figure out who I work with now. Um, I'm actually splitting time with San Francisco because I'm working with a basketball team up there, yeah. my home team, not them, but one player in particular, which is awesome. like super exciting. Um, mostly because it's finally, finally after 10 years, I'm working with my home team. I'm so tired of helping the competition. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. can I help my <laughs> own team? Um, but I digress. You could figure out how to eat um, following your feed, my feed on a really basic level. I do have some of my favorite foods that I seem to think digest well across the board with people. Things like beets, avocados, blueberries, leafy greens, hemp seeds, um, pro clean proteins. It's, it's like, you know, really crazy science here. <laughs> yeah. Funny, You're now you're giving my entire ingredient list for our living lean program, by the way, <laughs> that's right? my gut reset program. <laughs> you know, Mary, it's so funny how I, I just did a, the curious Jones podcast, uh, earlier this morning. And I said, you know, we're living in a world today that I'm a contrarian because I tell people to eat healthy whole foods and wide variety that comes from, you know, mostly organic natural sources devoid of synthetic toxic chemicals to eat plants and eat animal products that suit you, your lifestyle, your background and your goals. I'm a contrarian now because I tell people avoid processed sugars and artificial sweeteners. I'm a contrarian because I say, Hey, let's get food from the yeah. planet. Yeah, let's yeah, not yeah. get it from a, a, I don't think that's a, the only reason people think you're a contrarian. <laughs> well, that's one of the reasons, one of the reasons, right? <laughs> I mean, 
it, 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 it's not, I don't want to say, it is frustrating because like your practice, my practice, so many people come to us so confused because they see the liver king running around and they're like, man, I'm living on liver and I feel fucking horrible every day. And I'm like, well, you're not taking the same stuff he's taking. So you're not going to look the same way that he does. Or, you know, young lady, I think in Texas, the attorney general of Texas, some fitness influencer I just saw um, is being sued by the attorney general of Texas for positioning herself as a, an expert with regards to eating disorders and selling people $300 template programs. Right. So this is this is what's rampant in the health and fitness community. It's, it makes me so angry because it's 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 how do I say this delicately. On one hand, people are vulnerable and I hate people that take advantage of people who are vulnerable. Yeah. But on the other hand, vulnerable people need to realize they're not that fucking vulnerable. Apologies if I'm not supposed to curse, curse. and, and, curse and take and take things into their own hands. Yeah. It, it, it took me a while. It wasn't until that last hospital visit. I'm like, wait, why am I putting my trust in someone else's hand? Is uh, People are not as vulnerable and as clueless as they think that they are or feel that they are. And they be, can com, become very empowered and learn, learn critical thinking, learn how to do A-B split testing with themselves. Like I really want people to give themselves more credit in that process. So they're not taken advantage of by whomever with the platform, whomever that knows how to string together really big words and sound authoritative. Um, it's, it's, it really, really angers me. I'm very lucky that for my private clients, I work referral only. So people that do come to me are very much of like, I'm ready to listen. I'm ready to work with you to come up with my programming. Yep. But the few times that I do, um, like once a year, I'll open up and take on a couple of, of uh, general population clients. And it is very much this, this conversation around, um, we gotta, you gotta unlearn. There's so much to unlearn that you, we're listening to the top two or three podcasters who are niche diets. Yeah. And it's even like you mentioned that and I can point to Rogan and he's getting a lot of, you know, heat right now in, you know, outside, but that's not what we're going to talk about. I disagree with a lot of his nutrition information. I'm friends with Joe, right? I've been on his show twice. I disagree with a lot of his nutrition content. And then like he just did carnivore, you know, so Joe's doing the carnivore diet, but he's eating, produce well buddy you're just an omnivore right 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 That's well the, the carnivore diet made me laugh so much so i will go carnivore a couple times a year because okay. i have a pituitary tumor okay um, a pituitary adenoma and uh so it affects my hormones quite a bit and yep. so when i know that when i can sense my hormones are telling me it's starting to grow or swell i'll do carnivore for six weeks get inflammation down and so but i don't post about that because i don't want people thinking like oh i need to be carnivore because mary is carnivore type of thing no you're right but but I, I would say, you know, carnivore is funny, just like paleo is funny. Like suddenly rice one day was okay with paleo when it wasn't. And I don't care. I but blame I just, Rob Wolf for that, by the way. But the figureheads of it are like, oh, rice is okay now. And I'm like, you made people scared of rice for how long? And yeah. now it's okay. Same thing with carnivore. And I know Joe too. He was using fat fudge and had talked about it several times on his podcast. But I also know that, that – that Joe's diet will change and evolve as whatever's popular changes and evolves too. Um, I just don't know why it's so difficult for so many people say, this is what I'm doing today and it's probably going to change, or this is what's working right now. And I'm experimenting. Like yes. I make a living on saying, I don't know, but I do know how to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. Now I, I want to jump over to your, your private business. So as a chef now, You've worked with, you know, some high profile individuals, but also you run other businesses. You being a chef, what is that like? Because that's more personal. Usually, now, now I would assume that you're working inside homes, right? Or how, how do you run? Are you run a yeah, so I, I know I, I take on, I, t I personally take on one to two clients myself full time. And then okay. I have two chefs under me. So we take on about eight to 10 clients per year. Okay. My chefs are ones that take on actors 
because it doesn't need as real time modifications. Yeah. And I will work with all the clients in the beginning six to eight weeks to do the gut reset program, do the testing, come up with the programming, and then they facilitate my programming for the actors. And then for the athletes, I'm with them more full time. How did you feel after the game? How did you feel after practice? What's going on with the injury? And we adjust uh, macros and micros and supplementation to them. And it is more hands-on. You become more than just a, a private performance chef for your athletes. Yeah. But it's like I take out capsules of, of supplements and open them, reweigh them based on the body metrics because a five foot eight soccer player shouldn't be having the same capsule as a six foot eight basketball player. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's out of their homes and we, we, prep everything for the travel game. So they're not eating with the hotels. They're not eating yeah. with the catering services there. There's no canola oil. There's no vegetable oil. There's nothing in there that's going to get in the way of their greatness. And I do specialize with, um, I'm getting a lot more younger athletes are now understanding the vision of like, how do I extend my greatness now? But I do work with a lot of older athletes and older entertainers yeah. who are extending their careers by result of not just nutrition, but nutrition is a big component of, of extending their careers. Yeah, but awesome. Now, you touched on before, and I do want to speak about your gut reset program. But before we really touch into that, if you could give us your definition of what is the gut? This is a term that it's often conflated. It's misunderstood. People don't understand digestion. They hear the microbiome. Or what is that? What is the stomach? Like, if you just want to give a basic overview into the gut, into digestion, and then how you are now holistically helping people, I would say, better understand their digestion and then assisting them finding the right food choices to reset their gut and move into a healthier state of being. Sure. I guess how would I super simplify it? Um, it just goes back to you are what you eat. And if you are fueling yourself in a way, your, your engine is getting fuel that is misdirected because there's no benign food. It's either going to help you or hurt you. Yeah. And so if, if the beginning of your energy source is messed up, every other piece of your body is going to be messed up yeah. and there it's an ecosystem. It is very adaptable. So it's not like you can't go off the rails one day. If you don't have an autoimmune disorder, it will naturally readjust itself over time. But you want to be on your gut side as much as possible and maintain that homeostasis. And it could be a matter of the particular ingredients you eat, how much of it you eat. It can be sometimes the timing of what you eat, but you just kind of want to be on your own side. I can go into the details of like gut flora and poop testing and, and also understanding that there's only so much we do understand about that. And even that yeah, conversation yeah. is going to continue to change. By the time you do a poop test and get the results back, guess what? It's changed yeah. by the time <laughs> you got the results. Right. So you get that information to, to make your best, your best guesses and hypothesis in the position that you and I are in, but also being really honest with them and being like, this is not the holy grail. Um, and you can see the results of what you're eating and what you're doing through different testing, whether it's stool testing or blood testing, et cetera. Um, is there anything you would add to that? I wanted to make it as simple as possible. No, I think that's a, a good overview, but now I do want to talk about the gut reset. So I think, and this will help kind of highlight what the gut is when you start speaking more specifically, what is the gut reset program? What is your goal and who would most benefit from it? So the gut reset that I did put out was the first time I'd ever put out a private protocol. I have a my whole Bible of protocols I do at different clients. And I would post about the gut reset. My audience was asking about it. And I was actually really nervous to put it out in this format because you asked me to work with one of the greatest athletes all time, one-on-one. -on -one -on -one. No problem. I got it. You tell me to put out a program for the gen pop like this. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> That's a good <laughs> idea. But it's really simple. So a client comes to me and I want to do a bunch of lab testing for them. If they haven't been eating a, a in quotation, cleaner diet for their chemistry. There's a lot of noise in their body. So I do a one set, one week long reset to remove the noise. Cause if they came to me and they're, they ate a bag of chips and Kentucky fried chicken yesterday and we test them, I'm going to be looking at tests. That's a result of those foods and not of what's really going on. So the one, one week reset is a combination of fast, fasting, mimicking, 
uh, omission and then nutrient density. There's a really specific bone broth that I make with like black cumin seed and eggshells and liver and all these things. It's, it's very medicinal. And they just drink that for the first three days with olive oil to help with some of the calorie stuff um, and the energy. And then after those three days, it's four days of repeating foods, uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And at the end of that week, I then run all the labs to get a clearer look of what's going on in their body and then build out their programming from there. Yeah. Now, that's what we do the first week. We will revisit this program and modify it through the season or while they're on set doing movies, depending on who the client is. It could be another three day. It could be a three day one, a four day one, a seven day one. But we'll revisit when we need to uh, reduce inflammation again, if they like go off the rails, if they were traveling, it just really is a reset. It's not a detox or a cleanse. It really is just a reset to get them going again. So when I put it out to the public, I said, you know, you could, cause the way it's set up, there's like note taking in there. Yeah. So if you have, when my clients have symptoms of the gut reset or, or side effects of the gut reset, if they get headache day two or a rash day four, that, is telling me it's information. So I'm like, oh, you have a rash on your elbows. You're a female. You're a week out from your period. Okay, that could be a progesterone um, overproduction. Like these are things that I know because I've been doing it for a while. But it's all information. So I I tell general population take all those notes down, do the gut reset, then take that one week of notes to a functional doctor, yeah. and they're going to be like, holy crap, this is amazing. I can now start doing tests and go from that. It's one way to use it. If you don't want to go that intense, you can do this gut reset as a, a preview into your Whole30, preview into one of your programs. So yeah. you get the most out of it. And then I do have five days of an example meal plan that is not boring at all, but it is following like a paleo format. So that's how people use it. Um, I put it out there. Some of the feedback there, I, I post some of the reviews on on my Instagram. I put it as this, this gut reset, this energy reset. But people are like, I had traumatic vein injury and those symptoms are starting to go away because we're reducing inflammation. Yep. If people were like, I lost 15 pounds, I explained to them, inflammation, not <laughs> weight, but imagine yep. how much inflammation you're holding on to, improve sleep. But it, it's it's not doing anything that's out there. It's just these are the foods I've identified in this order. The bone broth is really special to me. It's an Egyptian yeah. recipe. Um, and there are some ingredients that are from Egypt. But it is considered that reset to sort of kick people off into what's going to happen next for their bodies. Excellent. And then recently, Mark Wahlberg was discussing your gut reset program. You posted so on your Instagram page. And can you speak to this very briefly? And I know he's working with a chef who's a great friend of yours, a professional chef, uh, Chef Lawrence. But can you break down? And Mark said that he actually went up losing. I, I don't know. If, all right, so it's not playing here. I don't want to take away from you speaking here. Um, so won't be played, but that's the wish issue. Oh, good. Can, Speak to that. It just it won't play in the background, unfortunately. Yeah. So so he what he was talking, and I didn't know that they were going to talk about it on Ellen. I was just getting pinged of like, yo, and I'm like, yo, that's awesome. So he's not a client of mine, but uh, Lawrence is a friend of mine, and so he will sometimes chefs will sometimes ping me to help with their clients. Yeah. Um. And so he was talking about how he was following a traditional high, high, high protein diet, <laughs> and his body was not loving that, and so he did he did seven straight days of my bone broth. That's really awesome. intense. Yeah. That's okay. So I don't Straight bone seven. broth, nothing else. Oh, oh my God. I'm like, why would you do that? Wow. But he's an extreme guy, but he, it was, it was a huge reset for him. He lost massive amounts of inflammation. Yeah. Um, and they, they now, now they're doing the reset, uh, the seven days, the way I intended it. Now they're doing that before every movie to get him started in a training. That's awesome. Which is really cool. And I like sharing my knowledge with other chefs because I can't take on all these clients. I also, there are exceptions of superhero clients I like working with because they're, they do some really crazy stunts that I love, yeah. but I, I personally enjoy working with athletes. So I do love teaching other chefs to be able to help more people that I can't work with one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I, I found personally that the, the one on relationship and time gets too intense and for me, like working with athletes, we, we, we do work with some of the, the actors and actresses per se, but we work with their chefs. So we do kind of like some overview. So we become more of a consultant than anything else. Let the chef be the chef. We can kind of give an extra set of hands or our perspective might be different. Some chefs are just classically trained for fa flavor. 
and food prep, right? Which is fine. They might not have deeper layers of the nutrition or to deal with certain health issues, right? You know, medical contradictions, prescription medicine, medicines, things like that. But that's not our wheelhouse per se. When I was working one-on-one, and I don't know if you've gone through this, the, the personal relationship of working that emotionally close to an individual was, it, it, it's a little bit much for me, for someone like me. I don't, I got to the point that I don't like that type of proximity. I like to be slightly removed from that type of emotion where we don't want to blur the lines, let's say, of the relationship. I like to be the outside consultant. I like to give the information. You apply it this way. Call me, whoever is on your team, please. But I didn't like being in the home anymore. But that was over the course of a career for a decade or so. I was in the home on the plane. You understand that, right? That became for me rather emotionally invasive, but as my young family was growing also, so priorities changed in time. So it's kind of a nice benefit. And I know that you can pick and choose and you have other chefs who are doing some of the work, which is a nice way to kind of deload some of that emotional commitment. Cause it's, you, I think great coaches, it must be emotionally attached to their clients. You look at the Vince Lombardi's of the world, the Phil Knights of the world, right? They're yeah. very emotionally connected to their client, but there is a yin and a yang to that. Yeah. I mean, I, I frame with my clients in the front end, like you will get me for a year. We will put yeah. together the program. You'll get me for one season and know that this has an expiration date because I like new challenges. Once I've got you dialed in, we've got the Bible of all your pre-workouts, all your mid games, all your recoveries, and I can hand this off to someone else. Yeah. I also work with a team of physical therapists, um, I sit on the board for different fitness technologies, like EMS suits, different tracking. And so I'm, I'm coming in as a performance consultant, building out this programming and then moving on when I move on. Sometimes they don't love that, even though we did discuss this in the beginning, <laughs> that's where the emotional, it's like your mind um, I want you here. I need you here. Like, because I know my athletes, I will be, I'll watch the, I'll be watching the games from the stands and I, I know exactly when the, when the drink hits, I can see it in their breath cadence. I know, I know before their, their trainers, the sidestep was a little bit off. Something's wrong. And they're like, no, they're fine. I go, something's wrong. And then 10 minutes later, they're in the locker room calling us. And I'm like, yeah, what? <laughs> but but I think I give a damn. I'm wired that way. I really, really give a damn. And yeah. I think that's where my athletes and my clients are like, I know I'm covered because Mary is here. Yeah. And and I do wish there were more people like me, not yeah. even from the from like the performance consultant side, like everyone on the team, just really, really give a damn. I also I'm not a yes man. And I, my clients like that. I'm not like, yes, you're right. It's like, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> and this is why, but that's why I only work with a certain number of clients per year, because that is the the load that I can provide before I do become very depleted because I still have another business to run with fat fudge. Yeah. I think a lot of that comes from, I had done bereavement and hospice counseling. I had done at-risk teen counseling growing up. Yeah. I, I, those things overlap and that's what makes me really effective with people. Yeah. I love what I do with athletes. It's been six days since I've been in a stadium and I'm very depressed. I cannot Aww. wait to get back to San Francisco nice. Nice. this week and get back in a stadium like sports fuel me. And, and so I, I think I will always be working with at least one or two athletes because sports and the sports arena is my like true love. It's my, the love of my life. And so I, I will always have that. But I, yes, it can get very, very challenging and be very, very depleting. You yeah. become, you can very much become as important, if not more important than everyone else in their life combined. And that is a lot of responsibility. So I do my best to create boundaries and expectations around that yep. and then teach the people around them how to also provide that support system. Because eventually I, I mean, who knows? I could end up having my own family. I could end up having my own partner, in which case they might have a problem with me <laughs> prioritizing this in a different way. Yeah. Um, but I do also learn a lot. It's really cool to know your athlete in that way where you can be Agreed. Up, up in a suite and know exactly what's going on. Yep. 
Agreed. Now, I want to jump into some of the community questions, just a few. So all of our badged up, as we call them, the badged up members of our community, they've subscribed to the channel. They've gotten one of the badges to just show that they, they support the channel. We appreciate that. And we offer them the ability to ask some of our esteemed guests some questions. So this question comes from Amir. He struggles getting used to diets because most diets don't take in part cultural foods especially Middle Eastern foods and Pakistani. The question goes on. How do you structure, structure healthy eating with cultural cuisine? Again, being from Pakistan. But I think that's a great question. How do you or would you navigate someone like Amir, who's from Pakistani background, has a little trouble adopting to traditional, let's say, healthy meal plans? What would you do in such a case? Or what Middle, Eastern, Middle Eastern food is super healthy. It's the quantities mostly, but like all the spices in Middle Eastern cuisine actually are medicinal. Like most of the foods I make for my clients are built upon a Middle Eastern format. It's just removing the dairy and the bread uh, because of the gluten and the grains for my athletes, keeping them optimized. But it's, it's, it's really looking at, okay, what are the macros and micros I'm trying to follow on the traditional healthy diet? Yeah. And what of the spices are included? Like any any sort of kebab yeah. is super healthy. Hummus, I make it with cashews because I don't do I don't do well with with beans. Yeah. But that is amazing. All of our salads are amazing. Kushiri is amazing. Um, I, I think Middle Eastern food is actually one of the healthiest cuisines out there. When you reduce the quantities, get the macros going right, and then just limit the – I mean, I haven't had pita in 11 years, and it's really sad, but I'll make pita with cassava flour. Okay. But it's 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 building using the spices and then still getting the, the flavor profiles that you love. Okay. Love it. Now, Billy Kay asks – He's an awesome member of our community, by the way, 68 years old and absolutely crushing it, like super A-type motivator. But do you have any suggestions, special needs for someone his age? He's healthy. He works out. He feels great. So uh, as far as I know, always open. He's just looking for new info. Anything that you would suggest for someone in his demographic who is pushing, exercises, eats well, yeah. like puts himself out there? I mean, no to, I honestly know when to step away from the canvas. You're feeling great. You're working out. Do you really need more noise? You really want Ooh, more I like noise? That. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> if it's working, it's more of it's working, keep going. Yep. Um, I would say always do preventative testing just to be sure. You, I think you just posted about that. You did a, a heart health test. I did. So I think, I think if you feel good, but, but you're of a certain age, staying on top of your blood testing to always maintain that and stay ahead of that. Yeah. Preventative um, screening is what I call it. Yeah. Just, just, just make sure you stay on that. But if you feel good, you don't need... You don't need more information. Yep. It can get really messy. And then you become some weirdo, like hooked yep. up to all these different weird technologies every morning. I need an hour and a half to sit and do this and do that and inject this and do that. Like, yeah, live your life. You become a uh, Ben Greenfield or Dave Asprey. No comment. Hey, now. <laughs> hey now. Hey, yeah. I got no problem saying it. Um, and they know it's true. They pride themselves on that. Uh, by the way, but also Brian S, you get the badge, you subscribe to the channel that costs absolutely nothing. And then click the join button right, right next to the subscribe badge, uh, um, subscribe button. And then you click the badge uh, you want. Appreciate that. Billy. See you soon. Now this is Jesse Lee, professional fighter. He, any advice on helping his older sister who is obese and wanting help for a way out into a healthier life. Anything helps. Thank you both. So what would you say if you were Jesse, put yourself in his shoes, how can you help someone suffering from obesity, you know, which we understand. And that, that's a pretty wide category here. Any suggestions for Jesse? Um, if she's wanting help, that's already a great starting point because you can't force somebody to make changes they don't want, yeah. but it's, it's, it's making just new smaller habits. I don't know how hard in the paint she'd want to go, but yeah. it's just starting with modeling for her or writing out something that's simple for her to understand and follow a healthier eating plan and something as simple as like walking 30 minutes a day, 60 minutes a day. And when that becomes habit forming for her and second nature, add something else to it. And that something else could be weight training, could be tennis, it could be whatever it is she'll enjoy. And then at that point, when it comes to diet, doing some more individualized <laughs> testing and building upon that, but making sure that it's easy for her to follow. It's fun. She understands her why and being really supportive in her process of that and then being very supportive if she ends up taking a few steps backwards 
being yeah. supportive of that. So she doesn't say fuck it and like gives it up. It, I know it's super hard when it's your family members for what I do for a living. I have family members who don't follow my advice and it, it's heartbreaking because you really want to help them. Yeah. And it, it's a, it's a fine balance of, being their family member versus being their coach because you can't fully be their coach. You have to be their support system in that process. Absolutely. Well, great points, Mary. I appreciate that. Now, last but not least, I do want to talk about fat fudge. So what can you tell us about fat fudge? The, the, the amazing product that's taking over the world, not just the fitness world. What is fat fudge? What, where did it start? And what is your goal moving forward? Please. So it was something that I was making my athletes. I don't like protein bars. I don't like goo packets. Um, I needed something that was easier to digest on the system. Like if you're in the middle of, of play, I don't need you stopping to eat a protein bar. Um, and I didn't like goose. Yep. So I would make a tahini based um, fudge, if you will, with different uh, ingredients, spices, micronutrients. And I was making that for my athletes. And then my athletes were like, I'm hitting PRs. And then the musicians I were working with were like, I had a great writing session. My actors are like, I had an amazing voiceover session. So I shared the recipe. The recipe went viral. People were posting pictures of it in sandwich bags, awesome. uh, taking it on runs, nice. military, taking it with them on bases, firemen, moms using it during labor. And they were like, you have to turn this into a product. So I took $600 Boom. and uh, started it out of my apartment. Um, and it, it's... I still am surprised. Like I get messages from like Olympic teams, from different organizations, from hospitals. Like we love fat budget helps us in all these different ways. So it's tahini based. There's three here. You can use them interchangeably, but if you want to be more deliberate, each one does have micronutrients and ingredients to help with like recovery or energy without caffeine. And even the original cacao has low dose caffeine, the equivalent of one coffee bean, because I'm all about finding your minimal effective dose. Yeah. I use it as a squeeze packet. Um, people do like mixing their coffee. My athletes, again, keep in mind their stature. They'll yeah. do four packets before a game. And then wow. I will mix them, mix up one or two packets with like applesauce and some other different supplements for them to reload halftime. And it's yep. so cool because when they go in at halftime, I'm like, can't wait to see them come out. They come out with like energized fire. And I'm like, I played a role in that. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, and so Fat Fudge is starting with these three. I'm coming out with um, tahini-based protein powders and basically anything you see me post about on Instagram, those sleep tonics, those mm -hmm. pre-workout drinks, those mid-game drinks. All those things I've been doing for the last 10 years with my athletes are going to become products underneath Fat Fudge. It is my company. It's not a scientist formulating. It's me with athletes. And so all those things will become products to the general population because I can't be everyone's performance chef. But all of this IP, if I decide to say fuck it and become an artist, at least we'll have, we'll have saved all of this stuff and made it into products for your average consumer to have. <laughs> awesome. Well, Mary, I appreciate you. Thank you. I've been a fan of your work and, you know, friends, you know, for, for long enough now to really um, appreciate you and endorse you and, and happy to share you, you know, with our uh, community here, point everyone your way. Everyone can find you on Instagram at paleo chef, uh, which is the first place to go. And then from paleo chef, they can pretty much find you everywhere. You have such great content, great information, a great soul, great heart. You're really doing a great job. Uh, for everyone out there. So I appreciate you. Anything to say, to share, any links, anything to look out for as we, we start to wind off? No, I welcome questions. So you're always welcome to hit me up in the comments on, on Instagram. I'm a little more sassy on Twitter if you want to get into it there. Yeah. I like watching live sports there for sure. So if uh -oh. you ever want to like <laughs> give me shit there. Um, Bay Area girl, so just be prepared. <laughs> 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 um, but no, I just think... Uh, I just, I just hope that this was valuable and everyone can find their, their highest level of like happiness and health, whether it's through my content, your content or content that they might one day create if they're inspired to, to start their own consultancy as a result of this conversation. 
Awesome. Well, you are amazing. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. And everyone else, thank you guys for being here. Make sure you check over the Mike Dolce Nose channel on YouTube. We're going to cut this up into smaller, quick clips. If you only saw part of this, we're going to take a lot of, of Mary's genius and share it over on the Mike Dolce Nose channel. Of course, this will live in full um, here on the Dolce Diet channel. Once again, guys and gals, thank you so much. And until next time, boom.